assisted death in Switzerland means that you can go to one of the centres and there's generally two options. You can either take a drink. Uh, most people die within about 10, 15 minutes. It can take up to hours to die that way. Uh, Life Circle, which is where I apply for mine, uh, they use an intravenous method. And that's done quite simply by an intravenous um, drip being put in. I was born uh, in Manchester uh, into um, an Irish-Italian family and I lived in a place called Ancoats. It was a really bad area at the time and everybody wanted to move out, including the cockroaches. My dad, Vincent Pandolfo, uh, he, was, he was a cracking fella, couldn't have asked for a better father and friend. Unfortunately, just at the, the latter end of 1999, he then uh, developed um, MSA-related the dementia, which was horrendous because it changed him completely from what he was. He was always a uh, keep fit for Natty. Well, the MSA put Paul to that because he couldn't, he couldn't move at all. Uh, but he was a kind, sharing man. He was uh, a man of high principles. But he it, became the very antithesis of that. He became crude, he became lewd. He had lots of day terrors, night terrors, hallucinations wouldn't know who he was. For the last four or five years of his life, I, he never called me Alex. All the people who were supporting Dad knew him, loved him, respected him, have, you know, as his relations or close friends, etc. He couldn't have had better care. He couldn't have had better support. He couldn't have had that individual support. Everything was unique to him. We met his needs as they came up as best we could. And he, what he kept saying to me, you know, every now and then he'd get like lucid moments and he'd be pleading with me, do something, kill me. You must better do something. Don't let me down. The only thing that stopped me is I was frightened of it going wrong. You know, if somebody had said to me, if you put this tablet in his mouth or if this needle goes in in this place and he'll die quickly and quietly, definitely, I'd have done that. It wasn't long after my dad died that mum was, you know, poor and we couldn't figure out what it was. She was suffering repeated um, epilepsy, but nothing, you know, people think about epilepsy, normally think about somebody shaking and falling, that kind of thing, but mum would be just closing her eyes at seconds, but she'd be having hundreds, if not more, per day. And she was in hospital, and my sister and I was told that... Um, She's probably got about a month to live. And it wasn't four or five weeks afterwards, it was nearly five years. So both of them ended up struggling for five years um, with incurable conditions, untreatable conditions, and no quality of life whatsoever. And they both were fully supportive and would have had an assisted death. Are you able to just explain for someone that might not know what assisted dying is? Assisted death in Switzerland means that you can go to one of the centres and there's generally two options. You can either take a drink, which is that Dignitask, um, and that normally involves you have to take a, a, an anti-vomiting drink an hour before you take your, your drink, and then you take the drink, and uh, uh, sorry, an hour later, you take, take the drink with the lethal drugs in. Uh, most people die within about 10, 15 minutes. It can take up to hours to die that way. Uh, Life Circle, which is where I apply for mine, uh, they use an intravenous method, which is a lot more humane. You've not got that bit of taste. You've not got that, well, I need to stop myself being sick for an hour, etc. And that's done quite simply by an intravenous um, drip being put in. And on the slide that goes in, is it called the capita, whatever the term is that goes in, the only difference between what you have in hospital and what's there is there's a slide on it and you have to be able to remove, you know, bring the slide down yourself. Whilst I respect everything that they do in Switzerland, what that does do is it discriminates against people who haven't got the, the mobility or the dexterity to move it. So somebody with locked-in syndrome, for example, wouldn't bear to have that death. And your personal relationship with assisted death, how did that come about? I think watching both mum and dad suffer gave me you know, that, that kind of confirmation that it was right. And I saw what could happen to people. 
So in March, I, I'd had a few problems. I wasn't communicating right. I was having trouble writing things to people. Time became a little bit of an issue for me. And soon after that, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So that immediately, that, that was, OK, I know where this goes. Oh, and his prognosis. His prognosis was three to five years to live. Um, although I could live a lot longer than that. I could live up to 11 years, but certainly after the three to five, I wouldn't know who I am or where I am or what I was doing. Generally, with Alzheimer's, it's, um, you can lose, again, it depends what part of the brain it affects. You can lose mobility with it. Uh, you can lose cognition. You can lose language. Uh, perception's a big one. A lot of people... A lot of people think, you know, they say memory is memory. Well, it's not about your memory. It's about an inability uh, to perceive, to see things clearly. It's um, a, an inability to better process that information cognitively. What can happen with a lot of people with Alzheimer's is paranoia. You know, so if you give them something to eat, they throw it away. If they want to give them medication, they'll, they'll fight it. You'll be in a situation and people will be telling you that you're wrong. You know, you want to go out and people are, are going to hold you down. Well, the, the instinct, really, is, is to fight that. And that's, that's the kind of impacts that it had on my dad, had it on my mum as well. And it's certainly something, you know, I do not want to be in a position, I don't want to be in a position where I'm being violent to people who are trying to support me and, and you know, love me, etc. But the, the interesting thing with the psychiatrist at that stage, I mean, he said to me that... Um, I was talking about earlier, and you don't seem particularly bothered about it. And I said, well, I expected it, and I've always been quite pragmatic. And one of the first things I'm going to do is apply for an assisted death. I'd already got in my mind, before I'd even applied, that if I, because I wasn't sure I was going to get the, what they call the green light, I wasn't sure I was going to be accepted or not, but I'd already worked out in my mind and took some practical steps where I could secure drugs that would kill me. Fortunately, that hasn't happened and I contacted Life Circle uh, and I just sent the medical records for when I said that I want to apply for an assisted death although you know assisted dying is about living <laughs> I don't want to come next week I don't want to come this year I just want to get that in place like an insurance policy uh, but then I got um, I got a letter back from them and there's a few more things that I had to do the first one was I had to write um, a piece about my family history, what kind of life I'd had, um, what the relationship with my parents was like, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then probably one of the hardest things to do, I think, uh, if, if, if you're of sound mind, is to write why you want to die. You know, like, I don't really feel like dying today. <laughs> but you've got to sit down and write that, and that, that can be really testing. And, and I think it was in the writing process. I thought, I just don't know what this is about. But during that process, I realised it was a really good, strong safeguard. You know, because to sit down and write where you want to die, believe me, even with a condition like Alzheimer's and the experience with my parents, it wasn't the easiest thing, thing to write down. The next thing I had to do was I had to go and get um, a capacity assessment of a psychiatrist. I, again, fortunately, because of my social groups, I, I knew a psychiatrist that I could go to. And then just after that, maybe, I don't know, maybe about three or four weeks after I sent the information off, I got what they call the green light, so I got a letter back from um, Erica saying, you've been accepted. Uh, just, you know, let, it's the, 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 any time that you want to come across, I just, just let us know. But if the day comes, or when the day comes, whichever you choose to use, I then have to go and have another psych assessment because it's a neurological disorder. And that can't be any more than 10 weeks old before my date, so I'd have to choose my date and after time I'm going to get another psych assessment to establish that I've got capacity. Two weeks before the death, I have to have um, a meeting with a Swiss doctor. And then the day before the death, when you go to Switzerland, um, you have to have another one with another doctor. Obviously making the decision to have an assisted death, what in your opinion is the difference between that and taking your own life? Because you mentioned that you had kind of had that as a backup plan. Yeah, yeah, I did. Massive difference. Huge difference. Suicides are done in secret. So you can't, it's not something you can share with the family. My ideal is to die at home 
and have a party in the morning and during the day. Anyone who wants to stay can stay. Anybody who doesn't want to stay can go. So sit around at the house, play some music, share some food, laugh, hopefully take the mickey out of each other. And then that'd be perfect. So it's open and it's honest and it's painless. An assisted death, people know about it. It's planned in advance. You could have your wake in advance if you wanted to. You, 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 can keep, you keep control of it. But everybody can share it if, if they wish to. They, they can have that part and parcel of it. And what you're not doing is dragging people into it. They didn't want any part of that. You could scar for life. Because the law isn't here. You know, people are either committing horrendous suicides or partners are conducting an act of compassion and love and taking the partner's lives, or husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, and ending up in prison. And, and Dawn, your friend, you accompanied her to Switzerland. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you describe her kind of like journey and how her final few days were? The, I mean, it was a long journey in, in application. It was, it was really, really stressful for Dawn. And I think she was getting towards the stage where she thought it was going to be too late. I mean, she, she had very, very severe mobility problems. She needed umpteen different joints replacing. And she was becoming more and more isolated in the house. And on top of all that, she started having brain bleeds. Dawn, at that time, you need, you need to be in Switzerland for three days, including the day of your death. Uh, you get there, you see one doctor, day two, you saw another doctor, day three, three you die. But Dawn said she wanted to go for a week. Um, like me, she was a product of the 60s, and we started partying in the 60s, and no one's told us to stop yet, so we haven't. So we, we went away for, for the week. Uh, it was in Baal. Where we could, we got trams round, we got a chair where it was needed. So, so we, managed, we managed to get her out. We sat in the hotel of an evening, ate good food, drank fairly decent wine. So we went into the centre, the, the morning of her death. I have had a couple of good days there. Uh, and we, I was like, kind of playing the music for her. She was up there, we got a bottle, she wanted a bottle of champagne. She went on the balcony. Um, it's really funny, I'd never, I'd known Dawn about seven or eight years and never known a smoke, and she was like a chain smoker. And she just said, thanks for everything that you've done, give us a cuddle and everything. And then she got on the bed, the intravenous drip was put in, and she was fine, we was nattering away about the things we'd been doing. And, and then you have to go through the questions again. So, you know, like, what's your name? What's your date of birth? Where are you? Uh, you know, again, so I'm in Switzerland. Why have you come to Switzerland? I've come to die. Do you know what's going to happen? You know, you've got this, I've put these drugs in here, do you know what will happen? Yes, I will die. You know, so it's right to the last minute, you're getting that chance to sort of say, that's it, I'm going. So Dawn said, okay, well, I'm, I'm ready now. She moved the slide. Uh, I had all of her hand on one side, uh, the other woman had her uh, hand uh, around, holding her hand on the other side. And um, Dawn said, I, I just, I don't want to die alone. And it was said, don't worry, we, we're going to hold your hand right till the end, you won't die alone. Um, tell my son that I love him. And then she said, Erica, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, and that was it. She just like, well, her jaw dropped straight away. So it must have been fairly, fairly quickly. And that's wait for the police to come. So it was the police, the medical examiner come and they were with Dawn for about an hour. And they, they do everything. They, the body's well looked into, they're looking for puncture marks, they're looking for any signs of coercion, any bruising. Uh, we had to tell Dawn to stop drinking because we didn't want the smell of alcohol, you know, on her voice as though she was drunk and she hadn't known what she was doing. And that, that, that was it really. We then went back into the, into bar, into the centre, uh, and started phoning round people to let them know what had happened. But it, it was beautiful. And how were you feeling on that day? I, it's, it sounds strange really when someone's died, but I was really happy because I could, I could make the comparison between what my dad had gone through and left, after that my mum went through and how horrendous that was and somebody that had stopped the suffering and the pain and got what they wanted, what they'd chosen. Uh, and Dawn, Dawn was sort of saying that um, in some of the interviews, it's the only way it could have been better is if it had been her own house in England, you know, with, with more of her friends who, who chose to be there.
in terms of yourself, if your like state of mind deteriorates, is it then you set a date for yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, I've had provisional dates in my mind several times. So I, I set a twelve. I always set a twelve month date for, for reviews. Um, I don't review it any longer, to be honest with you. I've, I've stopped reviewing it. It's, uh, I just decided to focus on on living rather than the possibility of dying. But I used to have things I, I, again. If you'd have asked me this question three or four years ago, I'd have probably said, well, maybe the end of this year. And what I was basing that on was skills, losing skills and, and losing knowledge. So uh, I came downstairs having taken a phone call and I couldn't, you know, I, I knew that I'd brought washing down. And I couldn't find, so the phone call finished, I couldn't find the washing, I thought. I'd already put it in the washing machine, which I didn't think I had, and I hadn't. Uh, and then I thought, okay, so I'm looking in the living room, I've put it on a settee or something, I've left it upstairs, I couldn't find it. And it was about 15 minutes later, I decided to have my breakfast, dump the fridge, and my washing was in the fridge. <laughs> but, uh, so it was little things like that, and I thought, if I start doing that, if I start not recognising people, it wasn't so much the quality of life, it was avoiding getting to that area, I suppose, where the quality of life was bad and questionable about capacity. Do you think that that decision to have an assisted death has affected your outlook on life? <laughs> I think what it has done is given me more time to carry on in the same way I've always done. I suppose it was, you know, people used to say to me, did you used to be a hippie? And I said, well, do you know what? An hippie wasn't a fashion statement. It wasn't the clothes you wore, it was an ethos. And the ethos was, you know, to accept people, to love people and, and to have fun. So I think what it has done is, uh, I think my outlook on life has continued to be what it's been for a long, long, long time. But what it has done is extended that life period because I'm not dead, which I would have been if I hadn't been for the goodwill of the people of Switzerland to support people from other countries. And can you understand why some people might disagree with the concept generally? I fully support anybody's viewpoint and I think they're entitled to a viewpoint where they're opposed to assisted dying and that is their choice. I believe in choice. People who oppose us don't believe in choice and it's pretty simple. If somebody meets the criteria and they want an assisted death then that should be available to them. If somebody meets the criteria and they don't want an assisted death then there should be sufficient funding within the National Health Service to provide um, palliative care for them. It shouldn't be a charity. It should be an integral aspect of the NHS. So they should have palliative care, good quality care, if that's what they need. For people watching this who maybe haven't come across an individual like yourself who's going to have an assisted death, what would you want people to know from your story? Well, for anyone who's, you know, if anybody wants to know any more about, about assisted dying, if they're thinking about it, I'm more than happy to help them and guide them. It's a choice for you to think about, you know, if, if you are thinking about it, you need to think about it thoroughly. I would tell your family about it, uh, but ensure that, you know, they, it doesn't matter what they say, it's your choice. And that's something to take that away. It's a peaceful death. It, it, it's a beautiful death. And if that's what you want, that, and you can afford it, which is a crime, you know, that's, that's something else that we miss out on the debate, that assisted dying does exist in this country. It's assist, you know, it's a, the very, very rich have always been able to take care of end-of-life matters, but the socially and economic, most socially and economically deprived have got no choice but to suffer, you know, and, and that, that's where the crime is. So everybody should be entitled to it. If the day comes when you do make the decision to go and, and die, what, what would you hope that your last week, day looked like? What would that be for you? Music, drink, and whether you can broadcast this or not, weed, lots and lots of weed. <laughs> <laughs> I changed the habit of a lifetime. <laughs>